My name is Pam Horan, and I built my career in internet media and advertising. And about eight years ago, uh, along with my uh, better half, co-founded a company, and we do some advising. We sit on boards, and we also do early stage investing, both direct and in, through some venture funds. And so um, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, uh, lead this discussion um, and take a look at what's going on in these challenging times. We heard this morning from Terry and Connor about kind of the overall economic challenges that are going on, obviously inflation and uh, interest rates, and then the geopolitical situation. So we've seen you know, a, a good decade of just explosive growth in terms of venture and in terms of PE investments. Um, and we obviously have seen some changes uh, in the last two years of what's going on there. So what I'd love to do is just go down the line, have you each do a quick intro, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Sure. So Jim. Thanks, Pam. Uh, it's great to be back at DMS speaking. Uh, my name is Jim Payne. I come from digital marketing background. Um, I started a company called MoPub, which is a mobile advertising exchange, which we sold to Twitter. And then I started Max, which we sold to AppLovin, and they're both now at AppLovin, uh, which worked out pretty well for everybody, I think. Uh, and now I'm uh, working on a seed platform called Breakpoint Capital. Great. Zach? Hi, my name is Zach Coleus. Uh, Washed up entrepreneur, spent a decade <laughs> in the, the ad tech ecosystem. So hi to all my good friends out there. Good to see y'all. Uh, and now I've shifted over to, uh, like I said, I washed up on the beach as being a VC, and I'm not leaving. This job is way easier than being being an entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> but currently, uh, current funds are about $100 million in early stage B2B software. So uh, try to find them when they're young, invest, help out, pray for them. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Schmidt. I'm a principal at Court Square Capital. We're a traditional private equity, LBO control type private equity investor. Uh, $3 billion fund, typical equity check size is 200 million, give or take. Um, we do a lot in marketing services, ad tech, digital media. And uh, thanks for having me today. Okay, great. Um, I think that, that we know that we've been going through challenging times. We take a, I'm going to share a couple of, of quick stats on kind of the volume of deals that we've seen for a couple of years. And then I'd love to get some real world examples from these guys. Um, and our goal is really to share some words of wisdom uh, as they think about the, the way that things have shifted and the way that they're thinking about their deals today, um, as well as um, thinking about valuations and really exits and where things are going. So in Q2 of 2022, there were 3K, there were 3,000 equity financing VC deals uh, valued over 61. One billion. If we look at this year, um, there are 2,000 deals, um, and they are valued at three billion. So, almost a third less deals valued at half the amount. So what I'd love to do is get a perspective, and as Connor mentioned, what's great is we have different perspectives here. Jim, more focus, is it fair to say, on, on seed, yep. early stage? And then the P. So talk to me about 23 versus 22 versus 21, which is obviously was a huge year. How has your deal flow changed in terms of the number of investments that you've made? It's a great question, Pam. I, and I also would include 2020 in that. And 2020. Yeah, only because <clears throat> I think the COVID pandemic shocked everybody, created a huge pause in most venture formation and, uh, and fall one rounds. Yep. And that shock, <clears throat> was basically unwarranted. So two years later, 2022, people were like, oh, this is a blip. You know, the blip is gonna be just like March of 2020 and everything's gonna be back. And so, you know, don't change any plans. And I think what is, uh, has been setting in over the past 18 months is a realization that cost of capital is now indefinitely higher. Uh, you're competing with <coughs> um, many other alternative investments in the, in the VC class and certainly in the seed stage uh, bucket. And the uh, activation energy to actually do a deal is much, much higher. So I think we're in a, a new normal of uh, essentially much lower uh, venture creation in, in 2023 and in the, in the next few years. And so for me, I, I, I see that it's resetting not in price, but in volume. So you still see these massive deals or uncapped notes, whatever it is, just far fewer of them. Zach? Yeah. Um, so in a normal year, I would do about 10 new checks, 20 total deals. About $20 million would be a good year for me. Um, 2021, 
that's what I did. That was a, that was a good fast pace. Uh, 22, I stayed on that pace, but the number of deals dropped precipitously, so bigger checks, fewer deals. And then 23, it's like I went off a cliff. Like this year, I've, I've done one new deal so far, and I'll be lucky, lucky to get to 10 million out the door by the end of the year. So like, um, and I'm seeing that across the ecosystem. Uh, generally, um, I mean, it was like, any idiot with a checkbook looked like a genius for a decade in this job. I mean, everything went up. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. I invested in 80 companies over the last eight years, and I only had two bankruptcies. And that wasn't because I was smart. It was because there was just so much capital chasing every deal, every follow-on round, every markup, every, and then just like everything went up. And so the, the FOMO, I mean, you just felt like an idiot when you didn't do a good deal. A good deal came along, you're like, oh, I guess I got to do it because it's going to get marked up next week if I don't. And um, so there was just like that shift from everybody made money to now all of a sudden everyone is hanging in midair wondering how far the drop is has been pretty precipitous. And then you get the P yeah. market. <laughs> Private equity is by far the most sensitive to this environment, right? Given we're utilizing debt to finance a good amount of our transactions, those markets have not fully recovered, right? Both the public debt and the private debt markets. Interest rates are what they are. Monetary policy also is in the tubes, right? Coupled with geopolitical tensions that could get worse at any given moment. Uh, Deglobalization, keeping inflation higher for longer, for probably the next 10 to 20 years, right? Relative to the past 20. Um, so yeah, that all shapes up to be, it has not been a, a very active year in private equity. In fact, it's probably been the worst year since the tech bubble for private equity, worse than 2008 by a lot of different metrics. And it ain't gonna get better in 2024, it may improve a little bit, but the quality of businesses in market aren't as good, the volume is way down. Um, but the bull case, and I don't know when this is going to happen, I do know it will happen, and good news for everyone in this room, private equity doesn't get paid to, to sit and have the money burn a hole in their pocket, right? It's impossible to make money unless you spend it or invest it, right? And so that will happen at some point, but there have not been enough forced sellers, people coming to market that don't, you know, if they don't have to, they're not coming to market in 2023 or 2024 because they're not going to get a premium valuation. Now, at some point, folks will come out. That'll start the healing process, and valuations will fully, fully reset, and we can start to get on with our lives. But I think it's going to be kind of this slower environment over the next 12 months at least. So you're obviously, Zach, shaking your head the same. So how are you thinking about doing business in this landscape? I mean, the great thing for our job is that, like, we get to wait. Like, it's, I mean. So it's a waiting game. I mean, that's I mean really you just sit and you're bored. <laughs> no, no, you do. Actually, it's been He's a busy. He's flying to Italy tonight, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's actually, uh, uh, it's a weird job because you, you want to do deals. Like, we get paid by deploying capital into good deals that will, you know, make a lot of money for everybody. So, like, our job is to do deals. I want to do deals. And so it's been, like, it's actually been a bit of a, uh, a mind fuck this year to be sitting there and looking at stuff and be like, no, 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 no. It's not, not fun. So hope, hopefully things, things work their way through the system. But the problem is, is that we had just a massive oversupply of capital. And, and the feedback loops really were in ways that you didn't really anticipate. So in like B2B SaaS, you'd see companies growing, you know, three, four X a year. Everyone's like, look how smart they are. They have product market fit. They have an amazing company. And now everyone has noticed, oh, it turns out they were selling software to other startups who had unlimited cash flowing in, who didn't care about price, and who would buy anything they could. And suddenly that growth rate went from insane to lucky if it's break even. So um, the, 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 the feedback loops have really kind of are ripping through the industry over the last couple of years. And, and until that all works its way through the system, it's, it's not going to be clear where we go from here. Uh, yeah, I, I think that true washout hasn't happened yet. You know, there's still a lot of uh, people and talent captive at places that aren't, aren't necessarily the right talent allocation. There's capital that's parked in companies that is not necessarily the right capital allocation. And, but it hasn't capitulated yet because of the oversupply of capital. Um, and so I, I think at that point, once that real true capitulation happens, a bunch of people will end up at private equity, some companies go out of business, we can reset and actually start working on the things that I think are gonna be the next wave of innovation, some of the AI stuff that we talked about earlier. You know, I know a lot of people who, are, who would love to be uh, entrepreneurial in that, in that uh, ecosystem. Yeah but ended up raising you know, $20, $30 million to go do a SaaS company, and they still have to prosecute that, even if it's kind of going nowhere. 
And so I, I think until that log jam breaks, uh, we're gonna be a little bit stuck, but it does seem like it's, um, it's coming soon. Is there one thing you would point to that said, that could say that would unstick the log jam? Is there something that you're looking for to happen to start to open your checkbooks? Well, I, I think it's a matter of time. You know, it, it's basically, the, you know, the, the subsequent <coughs> checks aren't happening. So people raised 18 to 24 months of capital um, <clears throat> back in 2022 when you, when you mentioned that last, you know, Q1 of 2022 is like the last train leaves, left the station. We're still sub two years from that time. So people have adjusted burn rate and they've reduced the headcount and they're making all the calls now and they're, you know, desperately calling everybody and, you know, hope, hoping for a bailout or a next round or a bridge or whatever. And these things aren't happening. Um, and it's, I think it's going to be impossible to ignore that Q1 of next year. So as you think about, you know, this is an audience, but many of them are entrepreneurs. They're, they're looking potentially to, you know, raise money. Any words of wisdom in terms of, of what they need to bring to you? You know, have you changed the way you're thinking about the types of people you want to invest in, the types of business you want to invest in? Zach? I mean, the secret to this business is all about growth. Like, if you don't have growth, you know, you, you really don't have anything. And so unfortunately, a lot of people pull back ju justifiably and correctly. They pulled back on their throttle. Everybody, the whole industry did. I mean, I saw it in my portfolio last summer, like 2022. It was like literally everybody hit a wall at the exact same time. Like the growth rates across this, all sorts of different businesses just like suddenly slowed down. Um, and so that makes it very challenging to go raise follow-on capital when you don't have that's, growth that's rates. Fair, yeah. um, and so you've got to... And the problem is a lot of things were overpriced. So the valuations, I mean, it was not unusual for us to see a company that had a million dollars in revenue and in 2021, and 2020, or 2020, 2021, they'd get a million in revenue and a big VC firm would show up and be like, oh, here's 20 on a 60, $80 million valuation. I mean, <laughs> like, that's a little insane, right? Now those companies are sitting on those valuations. They're running out of that $20 million and maybe they're at three, $4 million in revenue. But given the current multiples, they're not gonna break their past high watermark. And the problem you run into is that like a down round is just so painful for everybody. Like repricing that asset and dealing with the, 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 the game of chicken between the insiders and the outsiders is really, really hard. Um, and so yeah, there's, you know, figure out how to find growth or um, figure out how to extend uh, as long as you possibly can, because sure. the, the current market anyway, very, very challenging. So your business is a little bit different. Uh, are you changing the way you're thinking about, I mean, I, I know you said it's really hard right yeah. now to even think about doing an investment, but are you thinking about it at all differently? The strategy hasn't changed, right? The strategy has always been the same, and I think the firms that have had that type of strategy for a long period of time are the ones that are going to continue to be successful. Um, but yeah, it's just, you gotta have thick skin, you gotta be able to sit on the beach, right? And say no. <laughs> it's not as easy to go to Italy, I don't know. It seems easy, but it's actually not easy. <laughs> it, it's tough, right? Because uh, you, you're looking for reasons to say yes most of the time, right? Um, I do think if we can get a lot of prints to reset the valuation levels, that is the one thing that probably can help this happen sooner than later. Sure. But who wants to raise a down round, right? Yeah. There's a lot of difficulties associated with sure. that. But yeah, until that happens, you know, I think it's going to continue to be tough. Okay. Well, one of the positive areas has certainly been in terms of the investment made in AI, right? I mean, we're looking at, you know, it, it being the shining spot in the, in the business. We heard this morning from Jeremiah that there are 9,600 projects, he's not calling them companies, um, because a lot of them may just be a feature. Um, and that, that's one of the questions I'd love to have each of you talk to is how are you really evaluating AI companies? How are you really discerning whether it's a company versus a product versus a feature? And kind of how, how are you thinking about investing in that landscape? Private equity is not going to lead the way and out Google Google <laughs> or, um, you know, outperform Microsoft. but. We are doing a number of interesting things at our portfolio companies of implementing AI for revenue generating use cases, right, and, and cost optimization. Uh, and those, those use cases are incredibly exciting and can transform a business in a number of ways. We're also utilizing AI as a firm to one, ideally make better investments decisions, things like AI enabled search, document retrieval and look back for the past 50 years of 
investing, right? Uh, and then sourcing as well. There's some, you know, it's called AI, but it's glorified web scraping tools is what I'd call it at this stage that are so-so. But really good for, hey, if you own a multi-site you know, dental practice, for example, I can find every single dental office that it competes with in this zip code, right? I can call that founder. So there's a lot of interesting use cases you know, coming into fruition now. They're still a little bit early, but I think they're gonna be game changers and, and eventually table stakes probably in two, three years time. And you guys are in the trenches. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Yeah. Um, how, how are you thinking about it? Um, uh, my, my view on AI is uh, it's an enablement technology ultimately. Okay. You pair it with um, a true domain expertise uh, then you can make certain businesses that would otherwise be pretty unprofitable or it'd be just impossible to do or scale, actually possible to do at a venture scale. So that's kind of what we're looking for. I, I think a, a lot of platform value is going to accrue to the people who can afford these expensive GPUs and large um, training operations. Uh, but you know, could we unlock marketing use cases by making people 10x more efficient or even 100x more efficient or enable them to generate creative on their own desktop rather than use a third party or multiple third parties and take many weeks to do it. You know, that makes businesses and certain business operations much, much more profitable. And that is the biggest problem that we face in SaaS today, I'd say. Yeah, so I have a, a company we, we funded in the past. Um, they built AI for drive through restaurants. You go to McDonald's, and instead of talking to a person behind the counter, you talk to the AI. And McDonald's bought the company. It was a great outcome. We're all super excited. And then they started it again in um, 2021. And I felt like a complete idiot because we wrote the check in November of 21, right at the top of the market. I'm like, man, like my LPs were not happy with me. Um, and uh, thankfully, they've, they've, it's an AI company built on LOMs, and they're doing voice agents for hotels and airlines and whatnot. And um, the technology is literally 10 times better than the last generation that we had built like two years before. Like, you, you will never wait on hold again in a couple years. Waiting on hold will be as much of an anachronism as dialing a phone. It's like it's over. It's finished. The technology is so good. And, so, and I'm seeing that across my portfolio. Companies that have AI at the core are able to have substantial product deltas over what they had in the past. So like pre, post, not like incremental gains, but like big gaps. And so I'm really excited about that. And then if you think about that, it's an enabling technology. So you take that voice agent that's AI and you do it for hot swapping leads or you do it for you click on the ad and you talk to somebody and it's live and they're just speaking to you in real life. I think there's going to be transformational businesses that can be built on these enabling technologies that are fundamentally different than what came before them and that are not incremental, but just they just rethink the way they go to their business. So I'm super bullish about it. Um, obviously, if you watch the open AI, I demo day the other day, and a lot of businesses get slaughtered um, by you know them rolling out a bunch of features. It's going to be a really bloody um, revolution, but I think it's a big change. I'm super excited. Okay, um, our time unfortunately is up, so I'm going to leave it on kind of a positive note, uh, and I uh, want to thank everybody for for uh, their perspective. Hope it hasn't been too depressing. Thanks, <laughs>